So thank you for joining today. And uh, I'm going to speak today on the chapters of the Bhagavad Gita 12 to 15. And within these chapters, I'll be focusing primarily on the theme of the flow of the Bhagavad Gita onward. So the Bhagavad Gita begins with uh, Arjuna asking, what should I do? And to help Arjuna answer this question, Krishna raises his vision first from the body to the soul. And it has become detached from the body and material things. And then you will be able to act wisely. And then from the seventh chapter onwards, Krishna lifts his vision further from the soul to the supreme soul, to Krishna himself. And then in these chapters, the focus is that more effective than trying to detach oneself from matter is trying to attach oneself to the divine, to Krishna. And that was the focus. And that focus is going to be concluded in this 12th chapter. Of course, that continues, the theme continues, but the focus shifts. Basically, within reality, there are three ingredients. There is matter, spirit, and the divine. So we could see this is called, often is, you can call it as MSC. You get a master in science degree. MSC is matter, spirit, and consciousness. In fact, that will be the theme of the 13th chapter. So the 12th chapter is a section where the focus is on attaching oneself to the divine. And after that, now we may understand ourselves as souls. We may understand ourselves as uh, uh, parts of the divine. As, uh, we focus on the divine, try to get attached to the divine. But eventually, we have to act in the world. And we have to interact with matter also. So how do we view matter and how do we function within the world of matter? That's what will be discussed in the last thirteen, last six chapters of the Gita. Chapters 13 to 18. So let's go over the 12th chapter. The 11th chapter ended with Krishna exhibiting first his universal form and then, uh, then re-returning to his two-handed form. And Krishna tells Arjuna that actually among all forms, the, the, the sight darshan of the universal form is rare, but rarer still is the darshan of the form of Krishna, uh, form of Krishna as a two-handed form. So now at this point, Arjun actually gets a question that there are broadly two kinds of person, two kinds of spiritualists. There are personalists and there are impersonalists. Personalists are those who consider that the personal manifestation of the Lord is the ultimate manifestation. And impersonalists are those who consider the impersonal manifestation to be the greatest. So now the question comes up, which is better? Who are more intimately united with the divine? And Krishna answers unequivocally. First he says that actually he begins the answer by, by giving the answer. Then he explains the answer and then he ends the answer by reiterating the answer. So Krishna is quite emphatic in this chapter. right? And Arjuna's question comes in 12.1 and in 12.2 Krishna says that Evam satata yukta ye bhaktastam paripasate e chakpyaksharam avyaktam tesham ke yoga vitta mahavin Arjuna asks who among the two are better. So Arjuna says, Krishna says mai aveshyamano ye maam he says, those who fix their consciousness on me, they are the most devoted to me. And on me in my personal form. And then Krishna says that those who worship the impersonal, they also grow spiritually. They also ultimately attain spiritual reality. But in 12.5, he says that the that path is very difficult. Klesho adhiktaras tesham avyakta sakta chetasam avyakta higati dukkham dehavad bhiravapyate. This is that it's very difficult. Now, why is it difficult? 
because activity is natural for each one of us inactivity is unnatural and therefore to become the path of impersonalism where we consider all activity to be illusion all forms to be illusion all relationships to be illusion all personalities to be illusion and we want to merge into the infinity of oneness that may seem very attractive proposition for someone who is who has had a lot of problems and just wants to get away from them just like sometimes when we have a lot of relationship issues we may say just leave me alone and we may we may genuinely feel i just want to be left alone but if people left us alone permanently we wouldn't want that just i want to be with people i want to talk with i i want i just at that time it's a reaction so i may have given this example earlier that if a person is sick and is in pain so they have arthritis and if because of arthritis every moment that they make they move their hand they move their leg it causes them pain and they think that oh if i could just stop moving i'll be so peaceful now it's true i could be i could be pain free if i could be stop moving but as soon as they become pain free immediately they will want to start move, moving because movement is a natural condition we are meant to do so many things in life that's where our energy is so the cause of the pain is being misdiagnosed over here the cause of the pain is not the is not movement the cause of the pain is the disease the the movement is the simply the stimulus that brings about the activation of the pain but the cause is deeper so the disease needs to be cured so similarly many of us may have had negative experiences with our with, with in personal relationships we get get attracted to forms and then we get become crashing down and the forms are temporary in the world the relationships are temporary so how we may feel i just don't want to have anything to do with this so the problem is it's a misdiagnosis the problem is not with form personality or relationships or, or even with the desires the problem is with that the, the it's all in a disease direction we are seeking in the material and the temporary that which is to be found only in the spiritual and the eternal so we can say that there is a if we have a y axis there is a point of zero there is negative axis and there is positive axis so the negative axis is material form material desires material relationships you could say material you could say worldly or self centered where we get attached to that which is temporary we get attached for the sake of our own pleasure and we get attached to things which which eventually are not going to last the way they are initially so that is negative axis and now we want to get out of the negative axis but formlessness impersonalism this is desirelessness all these are like the from the negative axis you come to this zero point point of origin but then from there there is a positive axis and that positive axis is spiritual form spiritual relationship spiritual personality spiritual desires so krishna says that uh, form personality desires all these are natural for us and if we try to get rid of them if we try to suppress them there is unnatural that's difficult so on one side he says it's difficult that's 12.125 and 126 and 7 he says actually if we try to connect with krishna in his personal manifestation then he personally intervenes in our life and the way he intervenes in our life is by giving us the opportunity to purify ourselves to elevate ourselves and he uh, also personally gives us his mercy by uplifting us so 12 6 and 7 talk about that where in krishna says that if you be devote yourself to me it won't be just you trying to elevate yourself i will uplift you so it's somebody trying to swim in an ocean and trying to come to the land and say somebody comes and lifts them out and takes them to the land so a ship comes up or a helicopter comes up the effort becomes much lesser so in the personal manifestation on one side is natural and on another side in the, in the personal worshiping the personal manifestation of the divine also gives us access to the grace of the divine 
in the impersonal vision there is no personal manifestations there is no possibility of getting grace this is of course a elaborate subject but this is the gist of what krishna talks about here in the first seven verses of the gita in the 12th chapter then 8 to 12 he talks about something else he says that okay is is talk about how bhakti is the zenith bhakti, loving devotion to a personal manifestation of the zenith is the summit is the pinnacle but if somebody cannot be at the pinnacle then how do they how do they access it so we could say that krishna has led the bhagavad gita on a trajectory say from attachment to matter to attachment to spirit from attachment to spirit to attachment to the supreme spirit to the divine and then the pure attraction to the divine and then after that now he says okay you don't have to go through this whole process of first detaching yourself from matter then attaching analyzing spirit and then moving toward the supreme spirit he says there is another way so in a sense this is is there's a slow talk it's like a staircase you take long long time you get to the top of the top of a skyscraper or the top of a mountain and then when you are there at the top of the mountain you realize that actually there is also an elevator and the elevator can take us rapidly up so the elevator is that krishna says you can practice bhakti at multiple levels so if you can just absorb yourself consciously naturally in me out of love that's wonderful if you can't then strive to love me strive to practice bhakti and if you can't do that then just to work for me and do service to me if you can't do that then work for a selfless cause at least get out of yourself start thinking of something higher than yourself so in a sense krishna is extending a ladder down if you can't fit at this level fit at this level you can't fit at this level fit at this level so the idea is god doesn't here offer like my way or the highway approach some traditions have the idea that if you're not following us then you're going to go to hell but krishna says no if you can't follow me at this particular level follow at this level this level, this level. and that way you can keep moving onward i'll come to this theme once again but then after that from 13 to 20 krishna speaks about when we are practicing bhakti now who can how can we know who is a devotee at one level you can say somebody who loves krishna but how do we really know that somebody loves krishna love we could say is in an inner emotion is there in the heart and we see that arjuna is in a setting where he has to function in the world arjuna is called upon by duty to be a martial guardian of society and fight so at this stage his, simply his absorption in krishna his love for krishna that is not so immediately relevant to his setting he has to function in his social role of course in a devotional mood it's a functional social role so krishna says that devotion also means that in the world we function in a way that is calm equipoise gentle non agitating responsible self control krishna has various virtues if you see these virtues which is talks about from 12 13 to 20 they are largely centered on on we could say cultured behavior gentleman lay courteous uh, uh, attractive behavior so the idea is krishna uh, we can't use devotion as a justification for behaving irresponsibly or insensitively or in inappropriately devotion also manifests in appropriate behavior in the world and then last word krishna says that okay even if one doesn't have these virtues right now if they're just practicing bhakti that itself is also glorious because they are being elevated by their own practices they are moving towards developing and growing in their lives by their practices so that's what krishna is focusing on over here in this context so let's look at 12 chapter so here this is 12 9 and 10 this is a gita daily article like earlier i have put a quote over here so i thought over here that 
strive more for the gift of presence than the presence of gifts. The gift of presence, that means that we can serve God at different levels. And ultimately, what God wants most is our heart. The gift of presence. So suppose we are talking with someone. Now, at one level, something which we can all give to somebody else is attention. If we just hear them what they are speaking, they feel valued. Now, we may want to give, we may actually be working only for them. We say, Actually, they may want to talk with us and they say, we may say, I'm talking on the phone to just get your work done only. That's good. But if they want to talk with us, they may, for them, to be heard may be important. So for Krishna, sometimes we may get too caught in the mode of working. I'll do this, I'll do that, I'll do that. And we may think, okay, by doing this service, I can do a lot for Krishna. Or if I do this, then I can earn a lot of money, then I can give a big donation to Krishna. Now, yes, if we have some resources, some inspiration, some, some aspirations, we can definitely use them in Krishna's service. But we have to know what Krishna wants the most. Krishna wants us the most. Krishna doesn't want what we, the things we give him. Krishna wants us to give ourselves to him. And that's why we need to focus on whenever we are we are practicing bhakti, we try to be present for Krishna. We try to be in the presence so that we can give ourselves to Krishna. And we give ourselves by giving our consciousness. There is spontaneous devotion where we, we naturally love Krishna and we naturally absorb in him. And that is below that is conscientious devotion. Where even if we can't spontaneously absorb, we strive to be absorbed. And by being absorbed thus, we grow. So, Krishna tells Arjuna, get your hierarchy right. That make sure that your purpose is clear. Remember yourself as a purpose and then work on the process. It's like when we are driving, driving expertly is important. But before we drive expertly, we need we need to, enough expertise to know where we are driving and to check whether we are driving in the right direction. Somebody may follow all the traffic rules, stop at the right signal, stay within the speed limit. But if they don't have a map, they don't know where they are going, then following the rules alone is not going to take them to the destination. Otherwise, on the extreme is you, fo you go, to, go to the destination but don't follow the rules. That's also not good. We have to follow the rules, but we have to also drive purposefully. So when we are driving, the first thing is to know the purpose, then is to know the process. Okay, I'm in India, I have to drive on this side of the road. I'm in America, I have to drive on that side of the road. That's fine. But the important thing is, where do I want to drive? So in bhakti, there are various, there is various services we can do. There are various spiritual practices that we can follow. The key thing is that our purpose is to offer our heart to Krishna, our consciousness to Krishna. Sometimes we get too so attached to doing a particular service that we get obsessed with it, and then we start uh, yelling at those who are who we feel are obstructing us in that service. We start becoming disagreeable. And then when that happens, then are we really, is our consciousness even offerable to Krishna? Consciousness filled with consciousness filled with resentment and irritation. And then in that situation, how is it worthwhile? To uh, we have to get our priorities right. And getting our priority right means recognizing that I have to make sure that my consciousness is offerable to Krishna. And then that means it is devotional, it is it is favorable, it is grateful, it is humble. Occasionally, of course, to get things done, sometimes we have to be assertive, sometimes we have to be strong. But habitually, our consciousness shouldn't be negative or resentful. If we are having so many services that, so many things to do that we that is making us resentful, and then when we are directly coming to Krishna of, to offer ourselves, we are not in the offering, we are not in the devotional receptive mood then we may have to do certain adjustments so that we can offer ourselves to Krishna better. So in the hierarchy, best is to just love Krishna and be absorbed in him. Second is, strive to offer your mind to Krishna. If you can't offer your mind to Krishna, then offer the body to Krishna. That means do services for Krishna, either by directly coming to a spiritual center and offering some services or working at our jobs and then 
giving the fruit of our charity, fruit of our of our labor as charity to Krishna. So there are various levels at which we can connect. That's the twelfth chapter. So let's move on to the thirteenth chapter now. Thirteenth chapter, as I said, it begins with quite technical things. It focuses on the study of matter and how somebody who is aware that they are the soul, somebody who is attached to the supreme soul, how will they function in the world? So Arjuna asks six questions over here. As I had mentioned earlier, that after the tenth chapter, more or less, the if the if you consider the Bhagavad Gita to be a class. A class has ended with the tenth chapter, and after that, it's all a question answer session. So, twelfth chapter was a question, thirteenth chapter was also a question, is also a question. And here, what is Arjuna doing? So, suppose we are, we have been hearing some spiritual subjects for a good amount of time, but then we come to a particular speaker's class, and that speaker's explanations are very good. Things which have been fuzzy for us are becoming very clear, and we love the explanations. Then we will take that opportunity to not only address questions specifically related to the class, but also general terms that we may have heard earlier. So, what does this term mean? Can you explain this? We'll ask. So, we will try to get understanding of terms that we are familiar with, but we are not clear about. And if the speaker is really expert. The speaker will explain those terms, but won't go completely off on a tangent and explain those terms. The speaker is given a particular class on a particular topic. May, the speaker may address our question and also integrate the answer to that question in the thought flow of what they were speaking. We'll connect that speak, connect that answer with the theme. So in this, that's what Krishna does over there. Here, Arjuna first asks questions about these six terms. Which are well known in broadly in Vedic parlance, uh, in the in the philosophical spiritual circles of his times, and he wants to get a clear understanding. What do these terms mean? And for that purpose, he starts by saying that, uh, and Krishna is answering. Krishna integrates the answers into his thought flow, which is going on in the Gita. So Arjuna asks six questions about six terms: Kshetra, Kshetra, Kya, Jnana, Gaya, Prakriti, and Purusha. So that is Kshetra and Kshetra means field and the knower of the field. Then there is knowledge and the object of knowledge, and there is matter and there is consciousness, Prakriti and Purusha. So the whole Bhagavad Gita's thirteen chapter is more or less an answer to these questions. So first Kshetra and Kshetra, Kshetra. Refers to the field of activity. All of us say we have our body, and whatever we do, first we do it in the body, and then we do it through the body. So, if I am to speak to you, I am giving this class. So, what am I doing first? Actually, I am uttering words, and by uttering these words, I am speaking at the level of the body, and then. The, the bodily action gets manifested. So if I now I'll tell you, if any of you have any questions, then some of you may ask some questions. If I if I am if I tell someone, can you please get, get this? And then we get it. So so basically, the body is our field of action, and we are the knower of that field. So we are different from the body, and we know the body, and we act using the body. So our field of influence is what is called a kshetra. Now the field of influence it is centered on, but is not necessarily limited to the body. So for example, if person A is the is a boss in a particular office, then their field of action extends over the office. They can order people around, and people will obey them. But if that person goes to the airport. In the airport, they can't order the employees around because that is not the field of action. If you consider somebody like the president of America, their field of action will be much much bigger because they'll be focusing on they they have so much more power, more control. So the field of action can vary, but the important thing is 
that the field of action is different from the action, the knower of that field. So in a sense, this is Krishna talking about difference between matter and spirit. But he talks it in a way over here to stress that, that while we are all working in the field of action, don't get so caught in that field that you forget that there is something beyond the field also. That there is the conscious being. And then after that, Krishna talks about from 8 to 12 about jnana. Jnana literally means knowledge. But here Krishna uses the word knowledge not just in sense of knowledge as a information about certain things, but knowledge in the sense of transformation and the, the virtues that bring about transformation. Historically, there have been different understandings of knowledge. If you consider Socrates he, and Plato thereafter, this, they basically said knowledge is virtue. That means if a person has knowledge, they actually manifested in their being virtuous. So as the centuries passed, Francis Bacon, who was one of the one of the pillars of the scientific method and one of the pioneers in science, study of science, he redefined knowledge as power. Knowledge is power. The idea was knowledge is referring to a scientific or technological knowledge by which we could gain power to mold the outer world according to our will. And today when we talk about knowledge, when we say somebody's got a degree, then we are largely operating in that sense of knowledge is power. So if somebody has a say, mechanical engineering degree, then they can, they can operate machines. At least they should be able to. Sometimes people have degrees without that expertise. But we talk about knowledge largely in terms of the knowledge of a particular area in the outer world which gives us power over that area. Now, this is knowledge, no doubt, but this is not the only knowledge. When Krishna talks about knowledge, he's talking about knowledge in terms of virtues. Uh, there is there's a remarkable similarity between the teachings of Socrates and, say, the Bhagavad Gita's thoughts. There are some historians who say that uh, the teachings of the Bhagavad Gita and the Vedic teachings based broadly were taken by some immigrants from India to the West and through some unknown tradition, they were available uh, to Greek philosophers like Socrates. Now, Socrates, when he's about to be killed, at that time, the reasons we use for the existence of the soul, that he's, in, he's indestructible, they're very remarkably similar to what is going in the Bhagavad Gita. So we are not here talking about cross-cultural similarities and historical origins of those similarities. But the point I'm making here is that conceptually, the idea that knowledge is measured in terms of virtues is not as unfamiliar or strange as it might seem. That, say for example, a doctor. A doctor is known at one level by how competent they are in, say, giving medicines, in prescribing the right, right medicine to cure the particular disease that they're having. But along with that, a doctor should also have compassion. A doctor shouldn't see a patient's sickness as a tool to make money from that. If the doctor starts seeing that and starts making unnecessary referrals, giving unnecessary prescriptions, then the doctor, instead of doing service, is doing disservice. So it is not that knowledge is not power, but in the hierarchy, if you consider, knowledge as virtue is more important than knowledge as power. If somebody has only power and no virtue, somebody has the power to cure the people's diseases, but they don't have the virtue of compassion, then what they do will be counterproductive. What they can do will often can be counterproductive. Of course, if somebody has only virtue and no power, that is also not desirable. If somebody has compassion, but they don't know actually, they have not learned their medical lessons well. That's also not Good. Here, in the, if you see the Bhagavad Gita is being spoken to Arjuna, and the, Arjuna already has competence. He's a great archer, the greatest archer of his times. 
and Krishna focuses here knowledge, especially in terms of virtues. So these are the virtues by which one can gain greater spiritual realization. So the idea here is that how would a person with knowledge function in the world? And how should Arjuna function in the world? Krishna says, exhibit these virtues. So knowledge is, explained, knowledge is explained in terms of virtues in the Bhagavad Gita. Then we have 13 to 19, where it is called as Gyanya. Gyanya is the object of knowledge. So, okay, we may acquire certain virtues, but what is it that we are supposed to know? In the world, anything can be an object of study. We could study something as basic as uh, we could take a, say, a mic stand. Somebody can do a PhD in the mic stand. Okay, what should be its weight? What should be its length? What should be the material that makes it? What should be, how should it contribute to the, the aesthetics and the acoustics of the room? So many things we could study. That's fine. It's useful. But the most important knowledge is the knowledge about the ultimate reality. There's a conversation of Srila Prabhupada where he says that he asks a professor, Professor Benford in Canada, what is the current scientific knowledge about the soul? Prabhupada says that the scientists say currently there is no knowledge about the soul. And Prabhupada says, and then, and then you have no knowledge at all. Prabhupada says, no. Sorry, the scientist says that Professor Benford says, no, but knowledge, but he says, scientific knowledge is of a different category. And they are walking in a park. So says, for example, Swami, uh, we, Swami, we have two large books which explain how, the, how this grass grows. And Prabhupada replies, well, even without those books, the grass was growing. And then he says, no, but why did, if God, God didn't want us to study the grass, why would he put the grass there? So Prabhupada says, my point is that you study the grass and forget the God who put the grass there. If somebody is in a prison, some, they can do a PhD in, in the kind of bars that are used in the prison, the kind of walls that are used in the prison, the kind of floor that is used in the prison. But the most important knowledge in the prison is how do you get out of the prison? So similarly, the material world, we can know about many, many things here, but it's all temporary. We are all trapped in the prison of uh, temporariness where we are all subjected to old age, disease and death. And therefore, the important thing is that we learn what is the way out. And the way out, the most important knowledge is for getting out is to know what is there out there. That means, what is the ultimate reality that, that is out there? Out there. Suppose somebody is in a jail and they want to go out of the jail. One main reason they want to go out of the jail is because they, they remember and desire all the desirable things that are there outside the jail. So for us, to know what exists beyond the prison of matter, and to become attached to that, that is the most important knowledge. So the Gnaya, Krishna talks about spiritual reality. And he describes it in quite paradoxical and uh, intriguing terms. So the, the most worthy object of knowledge for us is all is the supreme reality. Because it is that attachment to the supreme reality that can get us free from the, from the prison of mortality. And then after that, 20 to 26, in this third chapter, Krishna talks about Prakriti and Purusha. This is basically matter and matter and consciousness. And here Krishna talks about two categories of consciousness: there's finite consciousness and there's infinite consciousness. And then he gives uh, gives various ways in which those souls who are caught in the world of matter can function so that they can become liberated. How Jnana Chakshu, that is the last section here, that focuses primarily on how we can how we can look at the world of matter in a way that doesn't obsess us, that doesn't entangle us, but that helps us to pursue and pursue and pursue 
the spiritual reality while functioning in the material reality. So that is the 13th chapter. Today we are trying to cover four chapters and we started late. So I'm going a little faster. So this is one section from the 13th chapter. So one of the things which Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita, one characteristic of knowledge is that one should see unblinkingly and unflinchingly the distresses of material existence. That that life is going to end in the graveyard. And before the graveyard also, there are many yards that are grave. Yards are distances and graves. We are, we are in a grave condition before that, where we have to go through old age, we have to go through disease. So now this is the inevitable end of life for everyone. With somebody, so life is filled with distress. Now somebody may say this is pessimistic. It's not pessimistic, it's realistic. And say suppose somebody is sick, they've got cancer and they're in denial of the disease. Well, as long as they're denying the disease, they cannot be curing the disease. So sometimes the doctor has to give a very grim prognosis uh, to jolt the patient out of that stupor of denial. And say, this is going to happen, this is going to happen, this is going to happen. This. And then I think the patient is this, okay, I don't want this to happen. What, what can I do about it? Then the doctor outlines the trajectory to the cure. And this is now sometimes the cure may also be demanding. But once the uh, doc, when the patient has understood how how devastating the disease is going to be, then the doctor becomes then the patient becomes ready to take up even the demanding cure. So similarly, for each one of us, we need to focus on recognizing the distressful nature of material existence. And to the extent we recognize that, this is the reality of material situation. And once we accept that, then the Bhagavad Gita is not pessimistic because it says that reality is bigger than our material situation. There is matter and there is spirit. So there is the disease condition and the disease condition is going to be worse. The disease condition is attachment to matter, obsession with matter. The infatuated infatuation that matter and material things will make us happy. But detachment from matter means we start understanding that uh, there is more to reality than the material reality. And then we redirect ourselves towards that. And that spiritual reality is all attractive. It is supremely potent. It is supremely blissful. And thus, the Bhagavad Gita message is initially pessimistic, but eventually it is optimistic. And sometimes the, the path to a better life begins with a hard look, hard look at the present life. We often don't change unless the price of staying where we are becomes greater than the price of moving to some other place. So the price that we will have to pay if we stay where we are, when we understand that, then we become, okay, I need to go somewhere. Let's say, suppose we are staying in a particular house somewhere and then the rate, rent is high over there, but you are able to pay it. But if that rent is going to skyrocket and we don't bother about it, then if somebody comes and tells us very strongly, this is what's going to happen over here, this is how it's going to go. You can't pay this much. Oh, then I better relocate somewhere else. So when the price of staying where we are becomes higher than the price of changing, that's when we change. So the price of staying in material consciousness but in material consciousness means attached to material things. The price of that is very high. It may not seem high right now, but it's going to become extremely high as we grow older and our bodies lose their capacity to enjoy. And then all that the body gives us is distress. So once we recognize this price is going to skyrocket, then I have to relocate. So that's what the Bhagavad Gita is doing over here. Right? It says, one aspect of knowledge is unflinchingly and unblinkingly looking at the distresses of material existence and thereby giving ourselves the necessary impetus to perceive and pursue spiritual existence. This is the 13th chapter summary. Till now, does anyone have any questions? 
So I don't see any questions. I don't see any raised hands as of now. So I'll continue. We move on to the 14th chapter now. And the 14th chapter focuses on introducing a new framework for analyzing material nature. And that framework is called the three modes of material nature. That's the name of the chapter. Let's discuss this. So broadly, there are three sections in this chapter. So 1 to 13 is how the soul is con conditioned by the modes. That is, the idea is that we, so the modes are basically subtle forces that shape the interaction between matter and spirit. So I won't go into all the subsections over here. Initially, Krishna glorifies the knowledge. And Krishna describes how the, the spiritual soul gets entangled with the material body. And then he says, when we are entangled, how, how are we exactly entangled? How are we bound? So the modes are subtle forces that shape the interaction between consciousness and matter. So the modes can be considered to be ro like ropes. The modes can also be considered to be like windows, depending on uh, our glasses, you could say. So depending on the kind of glass we are wearing, if I am wearing a red colored glass, everything I see will seem red. If I am wearing a blue colored glass, everything will seem blue. So the, the, the glasses and the ropes, basically we interact with the world in two ways. We acquire knowledge from the world and then we act in the world. So this, this we have two sets of senses. We call them the knowledge acquiring senses, the eyes, the ears, the nose, the tongue, the skin, through which we get information about the world outside. And then we have the working senses through which we act in the world. The hands, the leg, the power of speech, the reproductive organs, the excretory organs. So through all these, we act in the world. So basically, we perceive the world and we pursue something in the world. And the modes affect both. The modes shape our more the subtle forces that shape the interaction between matter and consciousness. And this interaction is two ways. What information we take in, what is the input, and what is the output. So the modes affect both. They are like glasses, that means they shape the way we per perceive things. And they are like ropes, that means they shape what we pursue. Now these modes are in Sanskrit called as Sattva, Rajas and Tamas. Sattva, Sattva means Sattva, Sat is existence or goodness. Good exist. Sattva is good existence or goodness as Prabhupada translates it. In the mode of goodness, one ex lives virtuously. I'll explain these modes a little bit later. Then raj Rajas is, means passion. Rajas means activity. Tamas is ignorance. Where one is apathetic, inactive, lethargic. Or sometimes one is destructively active. So we could say there are three kinds of people. Some people make things happen, some people watch things happen, and some people wonder what happened. So some people make things happen. They are the people in Sattva, they think, they observe, they understand, and then they act. So we could say the defining characters of Sattva is, is reflection before action. The defining characteristic of passion, Rajas, is action before reflection. Say, look before you leap or just do it. Or just do it, of course, is Nike's slogan. It's very popular because it reflects the, 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 the ethos of today's world. The people are quite impulsive. Just buy it. Just wear it. Just do it. Now, of course, there are times when we should just do it and stop. When we are overthinking, we need to get into the action. But sometimes we can be unthinking and do things. 
So if there is one action before reflection, that is passion. If there is reflection before action, that is goodness. And if there is no action, no reflection, simply delusion. Person simply lost in their head. Then that is ignorance. So, like I said, just do it is good for somebody who is lost in the head and not doing anything. Just start doing something. But just do it is not good if we can think and act more wisely. So don't act unthinkingly, but don't don't be unthinking. Don't be overthinking also. Now within now I won't go so much into the specifics of the uh, modes as analyzed by Krishna because it's an entirely new concept, and I'll try to explain the concept. And in that connection, I'll talk about some verse, some points which Krishna makes in the verses. So basically, for each one of us. If we try to make sense of ourselves, we are complicated beings. That means sometimes we do something and then we wonder, why did I do that? And if somebody asks us, why did we do that? We may struggle to give an explanation ourselves. A, a universal insight in psychology is that we are not masters in our own house. That no. Many things happen within us which are neither initiated by us or nor are they controlled by us. Sometimes we speak in ways that are completely contrary to our values and our purposes against our interests. Sometimes we act and we succumb. We act, we succumb to some temptations. We get deluded. So now this inner complexity can be very bewildering. And different thinkers have come up with different models of the mind to make sense of the inner complexity. And the modes are one such model. We could say that it's, it's in the Bhagavad Gita, it's a time-honored model, and it's not just in the Bhagavad Gita. In, in India, almost all major systems of thought that have emerged have considered, at least in the medieval or ancient times, they've included the concept of the modes as central to understanding the nature of material existence. So in the modes, when we are when we are functioning, there are certain kinds of attitudes and emotions that become natural for us. So suppose somebody is suppose three people are watching a movie and suddenly there's a loud noise, somebody screams fire. And then at one corner of the theater, you see a big red blazing fire. Now, most people would just rush to the nearest exit and try to run as fast as they can. Often when some accidents happen in some crowded places like theaters, the casualties are not so much because of that accident as because of the stampede caused by the accident. So if everybody tries to run toward the exit and some people fall and others run over them, then the people who are run over like that can even die. So this thinking, this acting without thinking, that's in the mode of passion. Now some people may just become petrified. The word petrify it literally means to become to become petrius. Petrius is to become like stone, immobile. So some people become so overwhelmed by fear and horror and terror, they just can't do anything. And that is symptomatic of the mode of ignorance. And some people may just okay, there's the fire. Now where's the fire extinguisher? Everybody will be running in this direction, but they will somehow get in the other direction, get to the fire extinguisher, get to the fire and extinguish the this is in the mode of goodness. Think before you act. So largely, most people today are in the modes of passion. And increasingly, many people are going toward the mode of ignorance also. There are, of course, in every society, people who are in the mode of goodness. And these three modes are not just uh, based on people. But say everybody has these three modes within us. And these three modes are in a state of competition within us. 
So Krishna first in verses five to nine describes the three modes in terms of the actions that we do, in terms of the predominant characteristics. Like I said, that the mode of goodness is characterized by knowledge. Knowledge means we think before we act. The mode of passion is characterized by hyperactivity. So Krishna says that these modes they interact with each other, they compete with each other. And thus, for example, in the morning when we wake up, I mean, just when you hear the alarm and you wake up, we might be in the mode of ignorance. Says, Why do I have to wake up? I just want to sleep. That is neither reflection nor action. We're just continuing in sleep. But uh, we wake up, we freshen ourselves up, and then we feel alert, we feel reflective, we feel receptive to higher spiritual wisdom. So we may be in goodness. And then the daytime when we start rushing around doing this, doing that, doing that, we may go into the mode of ignorance. And in that way, we oscillate across various situations. And thus we end up getting trapped, getting entrapped. Sometimes we are in the mode of ignorance where we just don't feel like doing anything at all. So all these three modes are there. They are there within each of us. And to grow spiritually, we need to rise towards the higher modes. We need to go towards the mode of goodness and beyond that is transcendence. So transcendence means to realize our spirituality. So we need to go towards the higher modes rather than stay stuck in the lower ones. And how we live, it has effects. You know, each choice that we make, it creates impressions within us. And each time, say, we act in the mode of ignorance. Say, if in the afternoon, maybe after lunch, we feel sleepy. And if we, we might just need a nap for a few, a power nap for a few minutes or whatever. But if you become lethargic and sleep for an hour or two hours or three hours or four hours, whatever. Each time we do that, the tendency, the likelihood that we may do it again increases. And thus, we end up, uh, so each action that we do is in a particular mode, and when we do it in that mode, it becomes stronger and stronger. The tendency to do that becomes more and more. And that's how we may get entangled. So long term, eventually, even where we will go after death, if we live in a higher mode, we go to a higher level of reality, where there's greater opportunity for inner growth, for spiritual understanding. If we live in the lower mode, in the mode of ignorance, we go to a lower destination, an area where there's greater ignorance, there's greater entanglement and lesser chance for illumination. So Krishna urges us to, at one level, uh, to rise in higher consciousness. And then finally, this is this 14 to 18, what I talked about briefly, and 19 to 27 is transcending the modes. In this, Krishna talks essentially about how each one of us can these modes are pulling us. They are like glasses which shape our how we perceive and the ropes like which pull us. So the best way to transcend the modes, Krishna says, first is become an observer. Become an observer of your thoughts, observer of your emotions. Now we, we are the thinkers of our thoughts and we are also the travelers with our thoughts. So when our thoughts go in a particular direction, we travel with them. But we are not just travelers with our thoughts, we are also thinkers of our thoughts. So when a thought comes up, Krishna says, don't just start traveling with it. No, think about it. Is this travel worth it? So we could say, give an example of a, say, a computer screen. Our mind is like a software which generates various notifications. And now, so the mode we are in will determine the kind of notification that will pop up. If somebody is in passion, or oh, do this, do this, do this, do this, do this, hundred things like that. Somebody in ignorance, oh, how can I escape this? How can I escape that? How can I just avoid hard work? That's what they'll focus on. So beyond this, if we consider that the notifications are popping up, but just because some notification has popped up doesn't mean we have to take notice of it. We have the choice. Okay, the notification has come, it's there, but I don't need to know. 
dwell on it. So Krishna says like that, become an observer of your thoughts and know that when the thoughts are coming up, they are, they are not necessarily your thoughts. They are, they are being induced by the modes within you. The kind, somebody is an alcoholic, then they will constantly get thoughts about alcohol. Now, even if they are trying to recover and give up alcoholism, still the thoughts will come. But they don't have to think, oh, because this thought has come, I have to, I have to indulge in it, I have to relapse. No, the thought has come, let it be there. So at one level, Krishna says, become an observer of your thoughts. But at another level, he says, just being an observer is not enough. Because you could say thoughts have like a gravity pull to them. Like a notification is there. And as soon as the notification pops up, the impulse tendency is click on it and see what is there. So like that, when a thought comes up, it has a gravity pull. And some, especially when somebody is addicted to something, then that thought is like a black hole. Its gravity pull is almost irresistible. So what do we do at Chaitanya? We need to direct our thoughts elsewhere. And that's why Krishna says, the way to transcend the modes is by becoming attached to him. He concludes that the way to to come out of the material entanglement is the modes are a way of analyzing and understanding how we are entangled and how these shackles they bind us. But the way to free ourselves from these shackles is not just by observation, but it is by devotion, by redirection. How does redirection help? It's say suppose there are many notifications which we are determined not to notice. But unless we have something that we want to notice. If we are studying for some important interview or exam, and that is just maybe six hours, maybe two, three hours away, then even if some, some very captivating notification comes up, we won't notice it. Saying no to anything is always difficult. But it becomes easier when we have something to say yes to. So Krishna says, say yes to me. Say yes to my devotion. Have, uh, have engagement. Be engaged with me and be determined to be engaged with me. Then you can say no to other things. The idea here is that we all have certain bad habits. You could say the modes, especially the lower modes, create some bad habits within us. And don't, Krishna is saying, don't try to fight with your bad habits. Because the bad habits often have a momentum of their own. It's like, say, if we are on a road and a big truck is charging towards us. If we try to stop the truck by our own means, it's impossible. We'll be knocked over. But instead, if we get into a truck, then the truck will have to collide with our truck and both will get damaged. That The truck the driver may decide, okay, I don't want to die like this. And we'll be here away. So, similar, so similarly for us, instead of trying to fight with our bad habits, we fight to develop good habits and let those good habits fight with our bad habits. Let our, so if we say, I will not do this, I will not do this, I will not do this. That is a very uh, depriving and uh, uh, depriving and denigrating kind of approach. You know, why, why did I do this? I won't do this, I won't do this. No, don't fight with your bad habits. We need to fight with them, but the way to fight with them is by cultivating good habits. So Krishna says the ultimate good habit is the habit of bhakti. Because why is it the ultimate good habit? Because it connects us with the one who is the source of all goodness. And connecting with him gives us inner strength, gives us inner purification. So any good habit can help us to counter a bad habit. Say somebody has a habit of just reading random, random news and stuff like that. And they find something very informative, something very attractive, educative to read. Once they start reading that, then they may not be tempted to read this. But if they start reading something spiritual, something about about Krishna, then it's not only they trying to develop the good habit, but it's actually Krishna. Krishna also attracts them. Krishna also gives his mercy. And then the good habit becomes easier to, becomes uh, much more effective because it's not just the power of the good habit, but it's also the power of the goodness of the Supreme coming through that good habit. So if you study the book, if you study any wisdom text, it can, it can make us wise. But if you study the Bhagavad Gita, it's not just the wisdom of the Bhagavad Gita that is going to help us. It is also the purity and potency of Krishna that is going to stream in through the wisdom of the Gita that is going to help us. 
And as Krishna says, the way to transcend the modes is Mamti Yogya Bicharena Bhakti Yogena Sevate Sagunan Samati Chaitan Brahma Bhoyaya Kalpate Just become devoted to me. Now this you know, Krishna says, become unflinchingly, undeviatingly devoted to me. And then you will transcend the modes. So somebody may say, but how can I be unflinchingly devoted when actually the modes are what are deviating me? How can be I, un, I can be undeviatingly devoted? So when the modes of passion, ignorance come upon us, they tempt us, they make us lethargic. So how can we stay fixed? It is because of the modes we can't stay fixed. And Krishna says, stay fixed and then you will give up the modes. So how does this work? So the idea is here, here Krishna is talking about fixity in intention, not necessarily fixity in action. Fixity in intention means sometimes oh, oh, the modes may overwhelm us. It's like if you consider mm, the graph of our desires versus our, uh, our time, sometimes the desires have a surge. We all have urges and sometimes the urges have surges. And when the urges have surges, we might just be overwhelmed. So that time, the, sometimes the mode of passion, the mode of ignorance just overpowers us and makes us do certain things which we know we shouldn't be doing. But what do we do at that time? Okay, we get overcome at that time. So we cannot have the fixity of action at that time, but at least have fixity of intention. Okay, after the surge gets over, what do I do? I again start resuming and continuing on the right path, continue trying to connect with Krishna. So... If we keep doing this, then gradually we are becoming stronger. And then over a period of time, when the urges come, and even when they have surges, we'll be able to be able to withstand them. So the idea is that Krishna says, have the fixity and intention to connect with me and try to act with that fixity of intention as well as you, as you can. And that way you can overcome the conditioning of the modes. So moving on to one theme. So how do these modes act? That's what we will discuss in this. So for how, what, how do the modes entangle us? We are compelled to do as we choose to desire. As we choose to desire. The modes are subtle conditioning. And we may think, I just have, don't have any freedom. But we do have freedom. It's, to understand this, let's go back to the example of the notification. So as, as we choose to desire, as soon as I desire, to click on that notification, then my whole screen changes. And then, in a sense, if I'm looking at the computer, then I have nothing else to see except what was there on the notification. So, so similarly for each one of us, the desire will come up with, many desires will come pop up within us. But as soon as we choose to desire that, then as soon as we choose to desire, then that desire takes over our consciousness and then we are compelled to do. So here there's a difference between having a desire and desiring a desire. We will all have desires, but we don't have to desire the desires. Having a desire means some, some temptation, some allurement, something pops up on our inner screen. So once we start choosing the desire, then things go out of our control. So the modes act by popping up desires in front of us and alluring us towards them. If we don't get allured, then we won't get captivated. So every desire that we have is not our desire. And we don't have to desire it. And if we have something more important that we focus on, that we dwell on, that we try to develop our desire for, then we can become free from the bondage of the modes. So any question about this? Till now. Okay. Okay, so let's go to the 15th chapter now. Okay, this is an elaborate diagram about three modes, which I'll just explain briefly now. We will run out of time otherwise. 
that here, if we consider in the mode of ignorance, as I said, a person is, if he's lazy, busy, crazy. Somebody is lazy, yes, in the mode of ignorance. Busy, no, completely inactive. Crazy, yes. Great, because they just don't think about anything, what is important, what is not important. They just get lost, deluded in trivialities also. In the mode of passion, one is lazy, no, people are active, hyperactive, they're busy. But they're crazy. Why crazy? Because often they don't think about what is really important for them. It's like in a mode of passion, we might get obsessed with small things and give huge importance to them. And in that sense, people can be crazy. They're busy, but they're also crazy. When we are in the mode of passion, because we're not really, we're giving far too much importance to unimportant things and not giving due importance to important things. In the mode of goodness, are we lazy? No. We're busy, yes. We're crazy? No. We're busy, we are, we are we are intelligently, wisely, productively busy. And beyond that, in transcendence, that means when we are devoted to Krishna at that time, are we lazy? No. Are we busy? Yes. But we are not just busy in the worldly things, we are busy in serving Krishna. And are we crazy? Yes, we are crazy for Krishna. It just like crazy for Krishna means what? A devotee, like there are so many other notifications popping up. But a devotee's heart and head is completely gravitating toward Krishna. And that's why the more we gravitate toward Krishna, then the worldly notifications, the worldly temptations won't trouble us. And pure devotees are those for whom the, all the world's notifications, they are not even noticed by them. Because their, their heart is fixed in Krishna. So that is, in one sense, being crazy for Krishna is both the recommendation for the cure as well as the perfection of the cured state. The more we try to increase our attachment to Krishna, the more we become free from worldly attachments. And the perfection of this is to become completely attached to Krishna and be absorbed in Krishna. This is a brief summary of the three modes here. Now let's go to the 15th chapter. So the 15th chapter is, in a sense, although I, I said earlier that this question, the Bhagavad Gita is going on with question answers, and that's true. But sometimes you know, a speaker might answer one question in a long answer, and sometimes they may give a shorter answer. So Krishna is asked by Arjuna a question in 13th chapter. And actually 13, 14, 15, and 16 are all Krishna's elaborate answer. So Krishna doesn't just explain the uh, those six terms that Arjuna asks, but those six terms pertain to an analysis of material nature. And Krishna goes further and gives, an analysis, gives the elaborate analysis of material nature. So here, the 15th chapter is called as the Yoga of the Supreme Person, Purushottam Yoga. And here is one of the most uh, well-known motifs, well-known uh, images of the Bhagavad Gita's philosophical message. And that is of an upside-down banyan tree. That here Krishna compares the world in the first six verses to an upside-down banyan tree. Now, when something is upside-down, what it means is, that it is not in the normal way. And in this context, it is, it indicates that it's a reflection. If we have a tree on a, on the coast of a bank, on the, on the bank of a river, and if we look at that tree from the other side, then we will see the tree and we'll see its reflection. And in the reflection, the tree will be upside down. So I earlier talked about y-axis and uh, y-axis, positive y-axis, negative y-axis. So Krishna is saying the upside down tree is like the negative y-axis. And the positive y-axis is the spiritual reality, which is the real tree. So Krishna, he, after he's introduced the concept of the three modes and explained that one should practice bhakti to become attached to him and thereby become free from worldly things, 
thereafter now he's talking in a different sense of the same theme of bhakti here he explains through another metaphor how bhakti can elevate and liberate us so he says if you want to get out of this tree of material existence first thing is detachment it's like if we are if we are captivated in looking at the reflection and maybe it's a mango tree and we see a mango in that reflection i want to jump into that river and i want to get to the mango and i want to eat the mango no 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 there's no mango over there no i want to eat it and we jump in and we may search for it here search for it there the mango will be always visible and always inaccessible always visible and always inaccessible always within view and always out of experience isn't that the way most of the world's pleasures are you can always see them but when you go to enjoy them they turn out to be an anti climax they practically never live up to the hype and then immediately we start looking for some other something else to find and like that we keep chasing mangoes but they are all reflected mangoes and what does krishna say first thing is become detached stop chasing after the mangoes and then instead he says become attached to the supreme reality krishna says that this world is a temporary place but there is another world which is eternal and that is my abode so redirect your vision toward me and if you do that you will attain me if you don't do that then you will have bondage and transmigration so if you stay captivated by the reflected mango then you will be you will keep going deeper and deeper into the river and you will get drowned over there so like that we will get bound in the material world and krishna says not only will be bound but will get will transmigrate from one species to another the soul exists not only in the human body but in various bodies and each body each uh, plant body animal body germ body uh, aquatic body insect body all of these are are coverings for the soul they are at one level like tools for the soul to try to eat different kinds of mangoes to enjoy material pleasures in different ways but in none of these can the soul experience real enrichment real fulfillment and thus the soul it keeps transmigrating from one body to another and krishna says that this is the this is what our predicament is and what is the way out of the predicament so krishna begins so this is till 7 to 11 and then 12 to 15 krishna says is that we need to see god as helping us in this world before we can trust that god will help us in some other world it's like say somebody is a beggar and then somebody comes and tells them that oh i am a wealthy millionaire you just leave the city and uh, come to my city and i'll give you a job i'll give you a house i'll make your life comfortable okay okay but why should i believe you so okay you are hungry right now here's some food for you your clothes are torn here take these clothes so then that person will develop trust oh oh yeah it's good it makes sense so if you can do this for me then maybe you can do much more for me in your kingdom I mean, then i'll come to you in your town your city your job whatever so like that we can't suddenly develop faith in god's transcendental benevolence in his kindness in another world we have to see his benevolence even in this world and most of the times we don't see it because we are looking in the wrong places we all have many desires and we pray to god for the fulfillment of those desires and sometimes those desires are fulfilled and sometimes they are not fulfilled and and when they are not fulfilled we start thinking maybe god doesn't exist maybe god doesn't care so oh, the world is such a place that uh, if we start looking for our desires to be fulfilled by god we will meet with frustration but if we look at a more fundamental level 
our very existence is dependent on things beyond us right now we are living and we are breathing we are not, we haven't manufactured the air that we breathe uh, even if we uh, work to earn money to get the food on our table but we don't produce the food nature produces the food what to speak of producing the food we don't even digest we can't even digest the food ourselves so there's a whole complicated mechanism for digesting food that krishna that that exists and because of which we are able to digest the food so the only time we think about our digestion is when it doesn't work we just take it for granted usually so from 12 to 15 krishna talks about how at the cosmological level at the terrestrial level at the physiological level we are all dependent on things beyond us and where are those things coming from at the cosmological level we are dependent on the sun and the moon for light at the terrestrial level we are dependent on photosynthesis we are dependent on the fruits and the vegetables and the vegetation growing at the physiological level we are dependent on digestion so krishna says we are dependent on so many things beyond our control and we are not controlling them and sometimes these things may go wrong but most of the times they do work right and who is making them work right it is god who is do, doing it for us so this is the eyes of knowledge gyan chakshu with which we see that that god is already doing so much for me in this world all that is happening which is enable me to survive and strive and sometimes succeed all that foundation is not laid by me foundation is laid by someone else so if instead of looking at our desires and whether god is fulfilling them we can look at the at the preconditions and necessities for our existence and see how god has already fulfilled them and thus we can see that god is benevolent and if this if he's already doing so much for us even when we are doing nothing for him even when we are godless god doesn't care less for us even when we are godless god doesn't care less for us god provides oxygen and water and air for everyone so when we see us in this way then okay maybe i should turn to our god and the krishna says that he helps us in our material existence and he helps us in our spiritual endeavor also if we want to turn towards him he will give us knowledge he will give us remembrance so basically three things which krishna says in 15 15 knowledge remembrance and forgetfulness so he says that these are three things which are required for us to function so if we are driving then we need knowledge of how to drive and then we need remembrance of okay this red signal means this green signal means this this is the lane i need to take and to some extent the word forgetfulness has a negative connotation but forgetfulness is the other side of absorption of concentration whenever we concentrate on some things we forget other things and without that forgetfulness which is basically being free from distraction just state of concentration we can't do anything productive these three things knowledge of what to do remembering how to do it and forgetting other things so that we can focus on doing it these three are required for doing anything in life and they are required for even functioning in spiritual life in spiritual for functioning for growing spiritually we need to have spiritual knowledge and not just in an abstract informational sense but we need to remember it when we have to make choices in life when we face temptations what do we do do we get caught by the world but if you remember no there is more to life my life is meant for something more than these pleasures which even animals are enjoying so if you remember that and we remember that we turn toward krishna and if we are turning toward krishna at the same time we are being haunted by our worldly desires then it becomes difficult to focus on krishna but if you forget them, then that's wonderful so remember so knowing remembering and forgetting these three are vital preconditions for us for acting and krishna says i am the provider of these three now of course krishna provide these based on our desires 
So the kind of desires we have accordingly to provide these things to us. So if, like earlier I said in the previous chapters, we are compelled to act as we choose to desire. So by understanding how Krishna is already benevolent to us, we can get the desire to turn towards him. And then once we get the desire to turn towards him, the desire to love him, we get the desire, we strengthen that desire, and Krishna will provide us knowledge, remembrance and forgetfulness as is appropriate. Then after this, Krishna says, okay, I give you spiritual guidance. And what is the, and for spiritual guidance, there are so many wisdom texts. So among those wisdom texts, what is their essence? Krishna gives it 16 to 18. Vedanta is a broad school of knowledge. And with, it is especially concerned with Veda Anta. Anta is end. Veda is knowledge. Veda can specifically refer to the Vedas, which are a body of, which are a body of texts which emerged in India. But Veda can also refer generically to knowledge. So Vedanta can mean the conclusion of the Vedic texts or it can also mean the conclusion of all knowledge. So the conclusion of all knowledge is given in 16 to 18. Krishna says that, what is that essential knowledge? And basically there are, there are two kinds of souls. Some of us are bound in the world, some of us are, are free from the world. And beyond the bound and the free is the supreme reality, is, is Krishna. And if the bound learns to love Krishna, the bound also becomes free. And learning to love Krishna is the purpose and perfection of all knowledge. And that's the conclusion. To know Krishna is to know everything. If we know that Krishna is a supreme desirable, then our life will be oriented in such a way that our life will attain its supreme perfection. That is the conclusion of the 15th chapter. One point from this. Krishna talks about the concept of jnana chakshu, the eyes of knowledge in 15, 10 and 11. And this I have phrased in this way that we need the eyes to see what our eyes need to see. What it means is that our eyes can see many things. But say if we are on a road, we can look at which car who is driving, who is walking, what kind of dress they are wearing, what kind of building is here, what kind of uh, shops are there. There are many things our eyes can see, but if we are driving on a road, what our eyes need to see is the signals, traffic signals. And to see those traffic signals, now if you consider, if you go to a big like Broadway in New York or some big metropolitan city, the, the road signals are are hardly ever the most attractive things on the road. In fact, we could say the road signals are among the least attractive things. There are so many people who may look attractive, so many buildings, skyscrapers, and so many other things may be far more attractive. But what our eyes need to see is not all those people walking, not all those shops, all those cars, but our eyes need to see the signals. Because the signals are the most important when we are driving. But to know the significance of the signals, we need education. So the eyes to see, in the first, in, we need the eyes to see. Here eyes refers to the eyes of knowledge, the eyes of education. So we need the eyes to see what our eyes need to see. So we need education so that we can focus on what is important for us among all the things that we are perceiving. So similarly, Krishna says in this, and what it means is, the world can show us so many things in here and many of them can be attractive but we need education to know what is what is to be seen what is to be focused on so in the world what is to be focused on most is god and his role in the world and when we see god and his role in the world then we can start connecting with him we can get inspiration to devote ourselves to him and ultimately we can attain him so this Jnana Chakshu, these eyes of knowledge, is what the Bhagavad Gita provides each one of us. And with these eyes of knowledge, our life journey can become less rocky, less shaken by ups and downs, because which will inevitably come in the world, because we will be steadily focused and purposeful. And most importantly, our life journey can be supremely fruitful, because we will progress through various walks of, various walks of our life, in striving to love Krishna and will ultimately attain him. 
So thank. So I'll quickly summarize what I spoke today, and then if you have any questions, we can discuss. So I spoke uh, the on the theme of twelve to fifteen chapters, and the idea is Krishna is moving now here from first he focuses on the body from the body to the soul, soul to the supreme soul. And that focus on the Supreme Soul in the 12th chapter, where Krishna says that better than worshipping the impersonal is worshipping him as the, per, in the personal manifestation. Because per, relating with personality is natural for us and the Supreme Personality is naturally merciful to us. So then he says that if we cannot connect with Krishna at the pure level, out of pure love, then we can connect at the level of discipline, at the level of selflessness, at whatever level we can. And this is connecting with Krishna. What is the what is the evidence of that? Virtues should be manifested, which can be appreciated, which can help us function better in the world, which can be appreciated by people in the world. Of course, even if we don't have virtues, we still have devotion that is good. And then 30 chapter talks about the focus shifts from okay, after learning that we have to become attached to God, okay, how will somebody who's attached to God function in this world? And that Krishna says. Uh, he answers Arjuna's questions about Purusha Prakriti, Kshetra Kshetra and Jnana Gyan. I talked there about how the field of knowledge, the, the field of action for all of us is different, but we are different from that field. And knowledge is seen not so much in terms of power as it is today. Knowledge also needs to be seen in terms of virtues. So Krishna talks about the object of knowledge primarily being the ultimate reality. When we are in a jail, the most important knowledge is how to get out of the jail. And then Krishna talks about how to put all these pieces together and see and function in the world with knowledge. As a part of functioning with knowledge, he gives us in the 14th chapter the understanding of the three modes. We discussed elaborately that modes are like glasses and like ropes. They shape how what we put how how we perceive the world and what we pursue in the world. And goodness means, passion means action before reflection. Goodness means reflection before action. Ignorance means no passion, no action, no reflection, just delusion. And we all are pulled by the various modes in our entire life. And whichever mode we choose to act according to, that mode becomes stronger within us. And the way to deal with the modes is first by observation, that we learn to observe our, our thoughts. We need to know that we are thinker of a thought before being a traveler with the thought. And then after that, I talked about how we can focus on also attaching ourselves to Krishna. It is not just uh, trying to say no to the various worldly thoughts, but saying yes to Krishna. Don't try to overcome, fight bad habits, cultivate good habits and let them fight with the bad habits. And Krishna says that we become fixed in devotion to him. The more, if the modes prevent us from being fixed, then we can have fixity in intention, even if we can't have fixity in action. And then in the 15th chapter, I talked about the metaphor of the three of upside down tree, which Krishna talks about. And there he, he basically gives another frame by which we can devote ourselves to him. So again, this analysis of the world, this world is, a, is like a filled with reflections of mangoes which you think are real. So we need to become detached from the reflections. Otherwise, we'll go deeper and deeper into the uh, river and drown. There, we'll become entangled. And how do we come out of this entanglement? It begins by, begins by appreciating God's benevolence in this world. And that, if we think in terms of whether God is fulfilling my desires, we may not appreciate. But if we see that God is fulfilling the uh, preconditions for my existence in so many ways, then we can appreciate at a cosmological, terrestrial, physiological levels. And then God also gives us our knowledge, remembrance and forgetfulness according to our desires. And if we desire Him, then He will give us those three things appropriately to go towards him. And the essence of knowledge is to know that beyond the bound soul and the liberated soul is the supreme soul. And that is Krishna. And if we devote ourselves to him, 
and he will elevate and liberate us. So thank you very much for your attention and participation. There's one question here by Aditi, so I'll answer that. Okay. So the question is that it said that on one side we said don't desire the desire, but other side it said that follow your curiosity. So is there a difference between desire and curiosity? If you act according to a dharma, then aren't we going to follow our curiosity? Uh, yes, definitely. We can differentiate between. There are different words which we could use for this. I think I introduced this concept in the third chapter and I talked about instincts and impulses. So we all have certain desires which are casual, just come, they stay for some time and then they go away. And certain desires which are which are very deep, and not just deep in terms of uh, desires that drag us down, but something which really we feel strongly about. So if somebody is an somebody is intellectual, now they will naturally want to want to read intellectual subject matter. So that, that is just their nature, and that can't be changed. But they could read intellectual subject matter that is atheistic. Atheists can also write intellectual books, but they can also read they can also read intellectual books that are theistic. So that are spiritually uplifting. So basically, we could say that we 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 more than saying. No to a more than specifically like differentiating curiosity and desire, we have to recognize that we have to have a purpose, and that purpose will be like our strongest desire. And when we say yes to that purpose, then we say no to other things. Now, discovering our purpose may take a long time. Some people may be fortunate and they may just recognize these are my talents, these are my abilities, this is what I want to do. Others may not be that fortunate. But we can just see within our context, what is it that is uh, most valuable for me, most important for me. In a sense, we can try to take responsibility for ourselves. And instead, we see from, like I said, ob become an observer of our thoughts in the 14th chapter. So we can become an observer of ourselves. Okay, this person is over here right now. And this, this person over here has these strengths, these weaknesses. These opportunities, these uh, these threats, like we talk about a SWOT analysis. So, look at that. What is the what is the best that this person can do? And then try to do that. So, if we act in this way, what will happen by this is gradually we will start making healthier choices. And once we assign a particular purpose for ourselves, purpose provides perspective. And okay, this is important for me. This, I cultivate this desire and I follow this curiosity and other things I say no to. So we all, ultimately, we have to learn more toward Krishna and attain Krishna. But we will channel our individuality in moving toward that ultimate reality. How I will move toward Krishna is different from how you will move toward Krishna. Because you are a separate individual, I am a separate individual. You have a particular body and mind. I have a particular body and mind. So according to our particular nature, we can serve Krishna. And that's why overall, if we take responsibility for ourselves and decide on a purpose, and we can, for how do we learn our purpose? That's also a long time, a long, big answer. But quickly, I'll say over here, that's it's intelligence, experience, and guidance. We use our intelligence to understand what our strengths and weaknesses are. We look at our own experience to see uh, what has worked for us, what works for us, what, what we also feel comfortable doing, what we are competent at doing. And then we take guidance from others. So by this, when we have a purpose that we say yes to, then we can say no to our casual desires which keep popping up. If now I'll, one of my main services is writing. Now while writing, I can just get caught in reading many, many authors to decide how can I learn their style. How can learn a proper style from them, a contemporary style from them? Well, that's good. 
but I can't be this endless reader and I never write. So I have to have I have to make sure that my desires, where I'm following my curiosity, is serving my purpose and not distracting me from my purpose. So Arjuna had a natural uh, attraction towards uh, towards weapons, uh, towards especially archery, and he developed that, and he became a great archer for Krishna. So it's more I'm talking more in terms of not follow, not desiring our desires in the the many casual and stray uh, stimuli that pop up in our mind and in our world constantly, and we don't get diverted and distracted by them, but we stay focused purposefully. Does it answer your question? So, any other questions by anyone? Okay. So, thank you very much.